blessed this morning by your ministry. I'm going to get you to dig out your Bible. I'm going to have you in the text that we'll be looking at today. And that text, you can follow that as an outline of the events that lose track of where we are. We'll be going back to the text. And the text this morning is 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. While you're flipping there, this summer, Sarah and I had the opportunity to go on an interprovincial road trip, during which we drove along the shoreline of Lake Superior. And during that time, we got into the discussion about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Many of you probably are familiar with it, and if you're not, you've probably heard the story, whether you realize it or not. But the Edmund Fitzgerald was a freighter of the Great Lakes. It hauled iron ore between the years 1958 to 1975. It was capable of hauling loads of over 26,000 ton. It was 730 feet long. So it's, it's huge, it's pretty big. And in November 10th of 1975, it was hauling full load of iron ore and a storm started and gained momentum and it was reported that there was gusts of winds up to 139 kilometers an hour and waves as high as 35 feet and a nearby <coughs> uh, vessel contacted the Edmund Fitzgerald and asked um, if they were doing okay and the captain responded back we are holding our own that was at 7.10 p.m., and that was the last communication with the Edmund Fitzgerald. Before it, along with its crew of 29, sank to a depth of 350 feet. The exact cause of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald is not known, but regardless of the cause, one thing is for sure, that it took on water. It was not supposed to take on water, and in taking on water, it caused it to sink. A ship lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, she goes to the bottom. So the church lives in the world, but if the world gets into the church, its testimony will sink. The church lives in the world, but is not to be filled with worldliness. Christians are chosen out of the world, no longer belonging to it. They are still in the world, yet distinct from it, that the world is not in them. Has anyone taken a look around lately and wondered about the state of the world? Has anybody noticed the priorities of our culture in this world and compared the contrast between biblical godliness? In our text in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, John writes to children of God to warn them not to love the world and that which belongs to it, but rather to do the will of God. I know you might be thinking, okay, this is, this is one of those sermons for those people. Or I hope so-and-so is listening to this sermon. But this sermon, sorry, this text is written to Christians. It is written to the church. So this sermon is applicable to everyone with a broad range of application. It's application we're going to look to address in three particular ways. One of them, understanding the text. This is the word of God, the unchanging word of an unchanging living God written to the church. So it's applicable to us. So to understand the text, to define terms, understand the terms, and to identify that in this world. And in so marvel at God's grace, mercy, and love towards us, to grow in gratitude for him, to be in reverence of him, praise and worship, and grow towards, as John Piper puts it, the white hot worship of the blood-bought saints. Second application, A.W. Pink says, the Christian who has stopped repenting has stopped growing. Your sanctification is the will of God. And third application, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you remember from our previous look at 1 John, one of the purposes of this pastoral letter is assurance that they know 
that they have eternal life. So it is tests on moral and doctrinal tests to evaluate so that you may know. If you remember, um, if you're going to go out on Lake of the Woods, if you know where all those rocks and shoals are, then you can boat with confidence as you navigate Lake of the Woods. So you may have confidence and assurance. You may know that you have eternal life. So the contact, context and the background, if you remember back to when we first looked into 1 John chapter 2, is written by John, the apostolic eyewitness of Christ's ministry, death, and resurrection. He writes this pastoral letter to churches in Asia Minor about walking in the light, Christ as our advocate, and about loving our brothers. And then in verses 12 to 14 that we looked at last time, John addresses Christians, if you remember, as children of God. This is a review of the last one. And their stages of spiritual growth and reminds them of their stages of spiritual maturity and assurance. John's interlude here, he lays down the groundwork for what follows. He tells them why he is writing, and then he writes. So turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So in this text, we want to identify what is meant by the world. We want to identify the reality of worldliness and examine the difference between passing away and abiding forever. So verse 15 starts off with saying, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Before we look at what this does mean, what does it not mean? It does not mean that it's wrong to sing the hymn, this is my father's world. It is not wrong to recognize God's power and creativity and majesty that is on display through his creation and in turn praise him for it. It is not a reference to nature. It is not a reference to all nations. Sometimes the, the word, the world, is used in reference to all nations. It is not telling us not to love people of all nations. So what is the world as it's used in our text where it says do not love the world. The world is an ordered system in opposition to God. John 3.14 tells us that the world hates God. It is a spiritual system of evil that seduces from God and is obstacles to God's cause. So if I was taking notes on this and I wanted to write down a definition of what is the world, I would write down as an ordered system in opposition to God. The world is the dominion of Satan. Ephesians 2 tells us it is the course of this world that follows the prince of the power of the air, now at work in the sons of disobedience, in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, by nature children of wrath. And thirdly, the world is the kingdom of darkness, hostile towards God. Verse 15 says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. What are the things that are in the world? John Calvin describes, um, he defines the things that are in the world as being the pleasures, delights, and all those allurements by which man is captivated so as to withdraw himself from God. So do not love it. Do not prefer. Do not take pleasure in. Do not long for. Do not prize it above other things. Do not be willing to abandon it or do without it. Do not love. So to sum that up, do not love this ordered system in opposition to God. Do not love the dominion of Satan. Do not love the kingdom of darkness. And do not love those allurements by which man is captivated so as to withdraw himself from God. Love for the world is incompatible with love for the Father. James 4 says that friendship with the world is en enmity with God, and he calls them adulterous people. He relates friendship with the world to adultery. 
Whatever is in the world is not from God. So love for the world and love for the Father are mutually exclusive. What belongs to the world is wholly at variance with God. So we continue in our text. Verse 16 starts off with the word for. This is the reason for, because, the reason why not to love the world. And then he gives a description of all that is in the world by describing three worldly pursuits. He describes the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So what is wrong with desires, you ask? Because without food, we starve and perish. And without marital intimacy, there is no reproducing. And aren't these things God's common grace for our enjoyment and pleasure? So before you start sending me John Piper quotes, let's first take a look at some terms and define them. What is the flesh, desires of the flesh? The flesh is carnal human nature. So again, if I was taking notes, I would write down a definition for flesh as being carnal human nature. So what then are the desires of the flesh? Some translations, depending on what you have, might also say the lust of the flesh. So what are the desires or the lust of the flesh? It is desire, passionate longing, lust, excited desire for what is forbidden, proceeding from unchanged part of us that is not transformed by God, from unredeemed bodies of flesh, gratification of fleshly desires. It is sensuous nature of man with craving which excite to sin. What does this look like? It looks like gluttony, sexual immorality, homosexuality, adultery, loving self more than neighbor. Desires of the flesh is fleshliness. What will gratify me? Second thing, what are the desires of the eyes? And again, depending on your translation, it might say lust of the eyes. Here's the desire excited by seeing. It is desire for what is seen, the outward form of things, the superficial. What does this look like? It looks like pornography, desire for someone who is not your spouse, envy, covetousness, discontentment. Desires of the eyes is what the eye transmits to the mind, which entices carnal desire. The third thing he uses is pride of life, depending on your translation it might say boastful pride of life it might say pride of possessions pride of life is empty haughtiness of the worldly minded it is vaunting boasting arrogant display ostentation swagger glamour empty show pride in possessions boasting in accomplishment it is insolent and empty assurance which trusts in its own power and resources it is vain glory it is idolizing reputation and self-image So he explains desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And John here warns not to love the world and that which is in it. If you consider back in Genesis, Genesis 3, consider Eve. God said, Genesis 3 tells us that God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither neither shall you touch it lest you die. So God commanded that. The woman saw that, if you remember, what did she see? She saw that one, it was good for food, desires of the flesh. Two, it was a delight to the eyes, desire of the eyes. And three, to make one wise, pride of life. As God had said, you shall not eat of the fruit, but yet she was tempted by these three things. She desired it, so she took of the fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life do not come from the Father. They are from the world, and the world is not in them. If you remember 1 John, John, he writes with tests so that they can test, they can examine themselves, and from these tests that they may know if if their affection is for the things of this world or if their affection is for, for God, then they may know that they have eternal life. About 20 years ago, I was in BC, and I was with some friends, and we were driving 
uh, from Lillooet to Whistler. If you're familiar with that highway, it's uh, on one side you have a cliff straight up, the other side you have a cliff straight down, two lanes, cliff going up on one side and cliff going down on the other side. And there's warning signs all along this, this highway. There are yellow signs that have pictures of rocks falling, warning people that rocks fall. We have those signs around here. I'm sure everybody's seen them. You see them so often, you become normalized and desensitized to the fact that these signs are warning you that there is the reality of danger at hand. Anyways, we were driving from Lillooet to BC, and it was nighttime, and we were driving along, and there was rocks that had fallen. As the signs had warned. There's rocks that had fallen on the highway. So we get out. We, we couldn't get around them, so we get out and started moving the rocks to clear away so that we can get through. And while we're doing that, there grew a um, pretty loud, deep rumb uh, rumble, and the ground started to shake. And it, what my first thought was there must be a train bridge right below us or right beside us. That's what it felt like, like a train was going by. And then one of the guys who was with us who had lived there his whole life, he, said, he yelled to us, everybody get up on the guardrails. So we jump up on the guardrails. Remember, it's nighttime. Behind us is a cliff that drops off into an abyss of darkness. And I wonder if my mother is watching this right now. If she is, it was totally safe, of course, in every way. But uh, yeah, a cliff right behind us, and then rocks started falling on the highway right in front of us, smashing against the road. And then rocks started smashing against the guardrails we're standing on. And when they're smashing against the guardrails under the, our feet, the guy beside me, we turn and look at each other. And when we look at each other, a rock goes flying right between us. Nobody was hurt. Everybody was fine. Um, there was no damage to the vehicle. But what I'm getting at is that the warning signs were there for a reason. Warning signs warn of the reality of danger. Sometimes we see norm, uh, warning signs and we become normalized and desensitized to the warning of the reality of the danger at hand. But John here with this text, he issues a stern warning to the church not to love the world. And he gives his reasons. Do we normalize love of the world by abetting in the sins of others, by approving, commending, consenting, or concealing the sins of others? We must not only have sight and knowledge that sin is sin, but see it as a breach and rebellion against the holiness of God's character and commands. Rather, we should be confronted with an understanding of the character of God and as such, in stark contrast, be confronted with the reality of sin, of worldliness, and the contrast that it is to God's character. Being confronted with this is what R.C. Sproul defines as being the trauma of holiness. If you remember throughout the Bible, um, Isaiah, he was confronted with the holiness of God, and he was, as a result, confronted with the sinfulness within himself, and he declared himself to be cursed and unclean. Habakkuk said, his belly trembled and there was rottenness in his bones. Peter fell at Jesus' feet, declared himself sinful and unworthy to be in his presence. John fell prostrate. We are confronted with an understanding of the character of God. We are consequently confronted with the reality of sin and ungodliness. All that is in the world is not from the Father, but is from the world. Whatever is in the world is not from God. Love for the world and love for the Father are mutually exclusive. Christian, this is written to Christians. Christian, what is your tolerance of worldliness in yourself? A.W. Tozer wrote that we have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. Worldliness makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. Are we so desensitized by the normalization and approval of ungodliness that when we are taking on worldliness, we, like the captain of the Edmund Fitzgerald, report that we are holding our own? So two questions. Question one, what do you love and how is that evident? Remember, John wrote with tests that we may know that we have eternal life. What do you love and how is that evident? Jesus said, if you love me, 
What did he say? If you love me, you will be comfortable. Did he say, if you love me, you will avoid trials and suffering? Did he say, if you love me, you will be wealthy? If you love me, you will be healthy. If you love me, you will have prosperity. If you love me, you'll be able to name it and claim it. No, he did not say these things. What did he say? If you love me, you will obey my commands. Do you think that a Christian can have Christ as Savior, but not as Lord? If the love of the world is in us, the love of the Father is not. Question two, what are you striving after? The course of this world? Or are you striving to form your life in conformity to the will of God? First Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Following along in our text, it says, For all that is in the world is not from the Father, but is from the world. And then verse 17, he says, And the world is passing away along with its desires. If our affection is placed on what is in this world, we are serving what is passing away, what will be overthrown and pushed out. So let's st step back, as he does in this text, let's step back and see the big picture. Revelation 22 tells us that right up until the end times, the evildoer will continue to do evil and the filthy will continue to do filthy. It says in 11 to 13, let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The world and all that is in it is passing away. It is fleeting. A description of how the world is passing away, of how it is fleeting, can be found in Second Peter. Second Peter tells us in 3 verse 7 that, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. He then in verse 11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? The world and all that is in it is temporary. It's passing away. It is fleeting. Verse 17 says, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So that begs the question, what is the will of God? Whoever does the will of God abides forever. The will of God is that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Not conforming to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 6, 6-7 tells us that we know that your, our old self was crucified. Love for the world and all that is in it was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing and that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. First John, further in First John, chapter 5, 4 to 5, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that he has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? If you are not a Christian and you're, and you're hearing this sermon, understand, if you have not repented, if you have not turned to Christ, understand that this verse that says, whoever does the will of God abides forever, it is not a matter of earning a right standing before God. It is not to be misinterpreted that we are to earn favor, that we are to earn a right standing before God. If you consider Adam, going back again to the original sin. Adam walked with God. Adam committed the one sin, and that sin was enough to cut him off from fellowship with God, secure his death, and the condemnation of all of mankind 
who descended from him, from one sin. Through the law, we see our misery, and through the gospel, we see our remedy. Gaining a right standing before God is a matter of salvation in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. So Ephesians 1 tells us, Ephesians 1, 8-2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. What does this mean? Well, we understand from Scripture that God is holy, God is righteous, God is pure, God is transcendent, God is not dependent upon his creation, and God is unchanging. So God's holiness is unchanging, his righteousness is unchanging, and God has commands for us to be holy and righteous. But we know that all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. The consequences of this sin is death. And upon death comes judgment. Upon judgment, if we are found wanting, then the consequences is, upon judgment, eternal condemnation, being cast into the lake of fire of eternal torment. It is not a matter of good outweighing bad, because as was the case with Adam, one sin was enough for condemnation. God requires absolute perfect obedience to his law. The Bible says that none can do this, that all have fallen short, that all have sinned. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God, took on flesh and in life as fully God and fully man, met with full obedience the full requirements of God's law, earning the rewards of perfect righteousness. And although he did not sin, he took on sin on the cross. He suffered and died to pay a penalty. By doing so, he purchased for himself a people for his own possession. By purchasing a people for his own possession, he paid that debt. He paid the wages of sin to purchase people, the redeemed, he redeemed for himself a people for his own possession. And that salvation, that redemption, how it is available is through repenting and believing. Jesus Christ not only died, he also rose from the dead. He gained victory over sin and death. He appeared to many and he ascended to heaven where he is seated with all authority over all things as our mediator, as our savior, our redeemer, so to gain, to have a right standing before God can only be in Christ. Being clothed in Christ's righteousness, the merit, the benefits, and the gifts which he earned on us. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, if you are not a Christian, if you have not repented, if you have not turned to Christ, I ask you, what is holding you back? We, we know that we all die. We are very much confronted with the fact of our mortality, that all will die. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And upon judgment, the only way to be in a right standing with God is to be found in Christ, to repent and turn to Christ, to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is holding you back? To the church, we, the redeemed, we have been purchased by the precious blood of Christ as a people for his own possession. We are not our own. We were bought at a price. We have been cut off, separated, and set apart from the world. Paul Washer uses a an illustration that I really like, he describes his wife cutting vegetables, preparing them for a meal. So there's the vegetables, she takes them, she cuts them, she cuts up the vegetables, they're cut off from the rest of the vegetable, separates it, it's set apart for a different use. We, the redeemed, are cut off, separated, set apart for God's use. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Abiding forever we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It means no thief can steal it, 
No moth can eat it, no rust can destroy it, no fire can burn it, no time can dissolve it. What will this look like? I'm going to have you keep your finger in 1 John. Is that another text? I'm going to have you flip over to Revelation 4. It's worth reading it together, having everyone look at it. What is this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us? What will it look like for us, the redeemed, when the world has passed away? Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Compare the two. Compare the temporary nature of the love for the world, which is impure, it is self-serving, and it is storing up wrath and is passing away, versus, compare it with, the love of the Father, which is pure, self-sacrificial, steadfast, faithful, and eternal. In conclusion, I can make six quick points in conclusion. If I was making no notes, I would try to scribble these things down quick. In conclusion, number one, the people of God are the people, sorry, the people of God and the people of this world are separate. Point number two, we are required to make a complete, and a complete separation from the world. Point number three, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Point number four, it is wrong and sinful to conform to the sinful, fleshly practices of this world. Point number five, the children of God are set apart and called to holiness and not to take, partake of carnal practices. And in conclusion, point number six, this separate, holy, God-honoring life draws the world to God. As we are con really confronted with the reality of the world around us and see the priorities of culture and compare it against the character of God, let us who are the redeemed praise God, um, be full of gratitude for his mercy and his grace and his steadfast love on us for calling us out of darkness that we might know the riches of his glory. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. J the first chapters of John, to sum them up, says, do not love the world or the things in the world, but do the will of God. Walk in light, love the brothers, confess that Jesus is the Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are good. You are good according to your standard, according to your character. You are holy and righteous. You are faithful. You are true. You are loving. You are just. And you are unchanging in your character. And your works are according to your character. Lord, we praise you for your excellencies and your wondrous works. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes to the depths of who you are the ways in which you are working and your eternal plan of redemption, what you have already accomplished, what are you currently accomplishing in us, our forgiveness of sins once for all and for our inheritance in your kingdom of righteousness. Lord, I thank you for your grace and mercy upon us, the redeemed, that we might know you despite that we have fallen short. I thank you for Christ's substitutionary death for us that his righteousness would be imputed to our account that we could be clothed in his righteousness seen as spotless without blemish as Christ is and gaining the merits and the benefits of Christ's righteousness and eternal life if there are those 
who are unsaved, who have heard, heard this message, I pray that you would convict them with the truth of your gospel, the good news of salvation. I pray that you would continue to build up this body of Christ, that we would be edified, that we would grow in unity of truth, that we would grow in unity of spirit, that we would grow in one mind, mind of Christ, and function serving various members of one body. I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would help us to be doers of your word, that we would praise you, that we would fear you, that we would revere you, that we would identify the world and worldliness for what it is, and seek to live lives of holiness and godliness for your praise and for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. I ask the worship team to come up.